Well, uh, welcome everybody. I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the uh, uh, Sumitro Chair uh, for Southeast Asian Studies and also uh, relevant to today's discussion. I'm a co-director with Mike Green of the Pacific Partners Initiative here at CSIS. And we're honored uh, uh, today to have um, uh, Mr. Wayne Swan uh, with us uh, for a version of the Banyan Tree Leadership Forum. Uh, the Banyan Tree Leadership Forum is a forum uh, for uh, speakers uh, and who come from leadership roles in their countries, uh, people who uh, make and influence policy, uh, and that's certainly the case today. Uh, uh, Mr. Swan is uh, an MP, a member of parliament now. Uh, his constituency is from Lilly, I think, is that right? And, uh, but he was um, uh, earlier uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Australia and the former Treasurer of Australia. As Treasurer, he was uh, very uh, uh, well known worldwide, uh, had worldwide acclaim, and was elected the Finance Minister of the Year, in fact, in 2011 by uh, Euro Money Magazine. He's also recently authored and released a, a book called The Good Fight, uh, which is his personal account uh, of his time in the Rudd-Gillard uh, government, which would be very interesting for any of you following Australian politics. Uh, that one uh, shouldn't be missed. Um, and he is uh, now going on to uh, traveling around the United States speaking about the no need to promote global economic growth and tackling the challenges of inequality. And I think uh, you've got a, a major report coming out um, either this week or next week, uh, Tomorrow, yeah. collaborative effort with uh, some of the other uh, most preeminent scholars uh, and uh, leaders uh, in the world. This event uh, is being webcast uh, live, and so welcome to those of you watching us uh, and live streaming. Um, you're very wise, it is a snowy day here in Washington. <laughs> it's, it's, it's cold, uh, as you can see uh, from Mr. Swan, uh, it's not as cold in Australia, he looks, <laughs> He looks bronzed, and uh, I look a little bit pale up here. At least one of us is, uh, is looking well. Um, and if, if you have questions uh, on the internet, uh, please uh, email them in through the, uh, um, through the Twitter uh, at, at CSIS Live and, use, and track us using the hashtag, uh, uh, hashtag CSIS Live. Uh, so without further ado, I'll invite uh, you, Wayne, to uh, make some comments, and then we'll, we'll open it up to okay. a discussion. If you don't mind, I'll just I'll use yeah, the sure. please do. I've got some, some slides. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Ernie, for moderating today, and thanks to the CSIS, thanks to the Australian National University for inviting me today. It is great to be back in Washington. It's a city I, I admire. It's a city I drive, derive uh, enormous inspiration from uh, when I come here. And I think this is probably the most relaxed I will have been in Washington uh, in uh, many years. I made a dozen or so visits to Washington through uh, the global financial crisis uh, and the years uh, after it during the Great Recession. And I can tell you on this occasion, I really do feel the difference. Uh, it's great to see. Uh, that the US economy is on the up and up, and of course that's thanks to the very good work of a number of people that I had the privilege of working with over the years, people like Hank Polson, Tim Geithner, and Ben Bernanke. I wanted to start today by just talking about one particular day uh, in Washington which is really seared on my memory from the very beginning of the global financial crisis, and of course that was an emergency meeting of G20 finance ministers here in Washington on, on the day of 11th of October, in the evening of the 11th of October, 2008. It was a Saturday night, I recall, local time. And of course that meeting had followed an all day meeting uh, of the IMF. The emergency meeting that night of G20 finance ministers was unscheduled because there was such unprecedented fear about global events at the last minute, President uh, George W. Bush attended that meeting. President Bush, I believe, in a very humble way, opened that meeting by apologising to everyone present for the consequences of the US subprime crisis and, of course, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the subsequent impacts of that in the months that followed. 
He assured everybody in the room that the United States would do everything they could with both developed and developing countries to do whatever it would take to meet that challenge head on. And just before President Bush was due to address the finance ministers, the Brazilian finance minister was speaking to the finance ministers in the room and he apologised for his very poor English. And President Bush leaned over and whispered into his ear, that's okay, my English isn't very good either. <laughs> now, the problem was that President Bush didn't realise the microphone was live. <laughs> and of course, his statement was broadcast to the 20 finance ministers <laughs> and central bank governors around the room, and it wasn't necessarily uh, the best way to instill confidence at the height <laughs> of the global financial crisis. But we did take his words very seriously that night, and he did follow through in what he promised he would do at that meeting. Two days earlier, I had stood on the floor of the US Stock Exchange, which had had its uh, worst day since the market crash of 1987, it dropped 7%. Uh, and of course the financial system here and around the world was in fact in chaos. That night, after the emergency meeting of finance ministers with President Bush, I returned to the embassy residence and I was due to speak via a secure phone to a special cabinet meeting that was taking place Australian time Sunday morning in Canberra. Now, as is often the case in politics, uh, the most serious of decisions can be taken in sometimes the strangest of circumstances. By this time, it's 10 p.m. that night following the emergency uh, meeting Washington time. But for some reason, some reason I've never been able to find out why, the secure phone line could only be set up in the basement bedroom of the teenage son of one of the senior treasury officers. So there I was. I've just spent all day at the IMF where it was chaos and people were very worried. We'd had an emergency meeting. And there I was, sitting on his bed, briefing the cabinet back in Canberra Sunday morning and taking them through elements of our yet-to-be-announced stimulus package and, of course, the bank guarantee. I was sitting there, and I'm doing this, and I looked up at the wall and I thought, it can't get any more bizarre than this. <laughs> there I was, looking at a Jimi Hendrix poster. <laughs> now, I'm pretty mad about rock and roll, and I couldn't get out of my head Bob Dylan's All Along the Watchtower, one of my favourites. And of course, Jimi Hendrix did it better than anyone. Now, I don't know if anyone in the room uh, knows that song, but feel free to join in. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't intend to sing it, but there's a message here. There must be some way out of here, said the joker to the thief. There's too much confusion. I can't get no relief. And that was going through my mind, and I'm sure the thoughts, those thoughts were going through the minds of many policymakers I'd been with that day. Because the cabinet meeting I had phoned into took two of the most important decisions taken by an Australian cabinet post-war. The bank guarantee and the term funding guarantee was absolutely essential to secure our financial system and, of course, our initial $10 billion stimulus package, which got us through the Christmas period without a complete collapse in confidence uh, and collapse in sales uh, across the retail sector. Because, essentially, by that stage, I, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet knew we were facing the biggest threat to the global economy, including to our own country, since the Great Depression. That uh, emergency finance minister's meeting effectively kicked off the G20 as the primary vehicle for economic coordination. And symbolically, given my topic today is inclusive prosperity, for the first time at the major coordinating body, which wasn't the G7, the developing world had a seat uh, at the table. What the G20 symbolises really is the radical shift of economic power in the global economy from west to east. And that was the first time I really think that had been openly uh, acknowledged because it was a recognition that the key to dealing 
with the events that had started in the United States and spread like lightning everywhere else was that everybody was in the same cart, both developed and developing. A recognition that if we didn't grow together, if we didn't do something together, we would grow apart. And of course, that's the reason that I'm in Washington this week. I'm here to release a report from the Centre for American Progress on inclusive prosperity. It's been authored by a diverse group of policy makers from academia, business, the trade union movement. It's chaired by Larry Summers and Ed Balls. And it aims to address one of the central political and economic challenges of our time, the need for inclusive prosperity in the developed world. As one of its authors and as, one of, and as a social democrat as well, I've always had a fundamental belief that we create prosperity to spread opportunity. We recognise that economic growth is not an end in itself, but an absolute precondition to the prosperity we must create to lift people out of poverty and, of course, to support a broad middle class. That's our goal. And our means come not just from active government, but from a strong and innovative business community, a healthy and vibrant civil society, including a strong not-for-profit sector and active trade unions. What I want to talk a little bit about today is some of my thoughts and experiences and lessons that were learnt during this period, which was effectively six years. Because there's a good Australian story to tell about our performance during the crisis, but also the performance of the Australian economy over the past 30 years. It's become one of the most open in the developed world. It's now in its 24th year of recession-free economic growth. And I can say I'm proudly from a country over that 30 years, and probably for a lot longer, that's done a better job at matching strong growth with social equity than just about any other developed economy over the past century. But I'm particularly proud of what we managed to do during the six years of the Rudd and Gillard governments. And not only did we grow, but we also substantially reduced poverty in our country in that period as well. Ours is a country where the overwhelming majority can gain a good education, valuable skills, experience the dignity of employment, feel that they have a stake in the character and direction of a national community and have the resources to provide an even better life for their children. Now that's a goal we aspire to for everybody in the global community. And of course, as was mentioned before by Ernie Kindly, uh, my book The Good Fight details what we actually did during that Six, years, six year period, all of the actions that we took were guided by a determination not to repeat the mistakes of the Great Depression when the economic orthodoxy was for harsh austerity. And of course, as this first graph shows, and this is something I'm incredibly proud of, and I believe all Australians should be incredibly proud of, is that despite the headwinds of the global financial crisis, when economies were literally shrinking before our very eyes, month by month, year after year after year, the Australian economy during that six year period grew by 15%. A spectacular result. And of course, while there has been a, an increasing concentration of wealth at the top in Australia, income gro growth during this very period among low and middle income earners was higher than just about any other developed economy. But to me, it's not just those numbers that count. To me, the real number that says so much about an economy, its performance, and its economic and social outcomes is how you measure social mobility. That is, I believe people have a legitimate expectation that irrespective of your background, your place of birth, you have the same capacity to succeed as anybody else. And we measure social mobility by looking at what happens as a, to a father's income as a predictor of what their son will earn. So this graph here shows once again that Australia, not perfect, not the best, but is one of, Australia still is one of the more socially mobile countries in the developed world. And of course, social mobility, diversity in population, high degrees of education, quality public services are one of the most significant advantages Australia has as we go forward to maximise the opportunities that should flow to our country from the Asian century. 
Now, why am I saying this today? Because I believe that it is the policy frameworks tried and trusted, uh, tested in our country over a period of time that have a lot to contribute to the global debate about the role of government in securing strong economic growth and the importance overall of fairness in securing the necessary structural reforms that are required in developed and developing countries to significantly increase growth elsewhere uh, in the global economy. Whenever I travel, I'm always struck by just how fortunate Australia is. We have challenges, we have areas of disadvantage, there are many things that we need to do in Australia, but comparatively, when you look at almost any indicator, take the OECD quality of life indicator, for example, and many others, we've done pretty well. Now, of course, our economy at the moment is slowing after you know, many years of relatively stronger growth and strong growth in incomes, uh, in incomes as well. But whatever is going on now in the cycle, if you take an overall perspective, our social mobility figures look pretty good. The point I want to make today is that these sort of act, uh, outcomes don't happen by accident. They happen because policy choices are taken or not taken at critical junctures to produce these outcomes. These outcomes are the result of th over 30 years of structural reforms that have made an economy more open to the world. Reforms like floating the exchange rate, bringing down the tariff wall, enterprise bargaining, all 20, 30 years ago now, but built on again and again. A decent minimum wage, collective bargaining based on a, on a decent minimum wage and a decent set of basic conditions. Medicare, a strong transfer payment system which is highly targeted and effective. And of course, universal national retirement income known in Australia as super. These are the sort of reforms that have seen Australia become the envy of the world. I know there's a view that somehow these outcomes suddenly have just materialised because of our relationship with China. For the record, it wasn't China that saved Australia during the global financial crisis, they were in one too. But the fact is that we are also a beneficiary of growth in the region. That is a big China story and is another reason why we can be optimistic about our future and it is a factor which propels our growth now and into the future. But it, 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 it is not the factor which has produced the underlying strength of our economy. It's back to all of those issues that I mentioned before. So Australia sat there, or has sat there over the last 10 years, right through the global financial crisis with an unemployment rate below 6%. That's where we were for a decade, even in the midst of the global financial crisis. Now, it's just crept back up from January last year to over 6%, and that's a challenge, but it still gives you some idea of the magnitude of the achievement. Now, despite all of, all of this success, we in Australia continue to have the same fractious debate that goes on in the rest of the world about the effectiveness and the need for fiscal and monetary stimulus. In Australia, conservative critics argue, as indeed as they do elsewhere in the world, that uh, the country or the world or Australia would have been better off not putting in place economic stimulus and uh, monetary policy stimulus. We would have been better having the cleansing power of a recession rather than intervening, intervening with substantial fiscal and monetary stimulus. Well, the truth is that if we didn't intervene the way we did with two very big stimulus packages, Australia would have experienced three quarters, three quarters in a row uh, of negative results, would have suffered much higher unemployment, all the skills destruction that comes with it, and of course, and the capital destruction, the small business destruction that goes with it, all of which dragged the rest of the world down, but not Australia, because we held our own. Later on, through 2010, Mining boom mark two kicked in and gave us extra impetus. For that, for that critical period, we kept our labour force intact. We kept apprentices in jobs. People were not relegated uh, to, to long and lengthy periods of unemployment. Glenn Stevens, our Reserve Bank Governor, had something to say about this debate recently, and I just want to quote him very briefly because I think it sums up the nature of this global debate. He says of the global financial crisis, quote, had it gone on, we can be sure that tens of millions more people would have been unemployed. 
but it didn't go on. It was arrested. As a result, we talk about the Great Recession. We don't talk about the Great Depression, Mark II. He went on to say, we might not like, like the politics or the optics of it all, but the alternative was worse. Now, this use of extraordinary monetary policy by Reserve Bank governors outside of Australia, because we didn't need to go to the extraordinary monetary policy measures that were forced elsewhere because legislatures were gridlocked. That strategy has come in for a lot of criticism, stinging criticism in recent times. But of course, if that hadn't been available, it would have been the Great Depression, Mark II. And as the Financial Times commented recently, levelling income and wealth with a colossal recession is no way to address growth or inequality. So for whatever the pluses and minuses, we're a far better place for all of those interventions. So why is this debate happening the way it's happening? And why have central bank governors rightly put their jobs on the line? And why is there such a rearguard action to demonise their strategies and those of governments that moved? Well, I think it's fairly clear. It's a debate about the role of government. All of this matters a lot because if we accept the conservative narrative, a fundamentally and demonstrably false narrative that laissez-faire would have seen us through the crisis, then the next economic crisis, and there will always be a next economic crisis, could well result in mass bankruptcies, mass unemployment and mass human misery. So this debate really matters. It's just a proxy for the age-old ideological battle between those who see government as a positive force for wealth creation in a market economy and those who would wish to shrink its role virtually away to nothing. And it is with us now. The recovery in the global economy following the global financial crisis has been underpinned, thankfully, by growth in the developing world. And if it hadn't been for that, uh, there would have things would have been much worse. And of course, if we didn't have extraordinary monetary policy in the, de in, sorry, in the developing, in the developed world, we would have had a Great Depression mark too. But at the moment, and this is why this debate matters so much, emerging economies are slowing. Growth in the developed world remains tepid at best, with output per capita in some developed economies 10 to 15% below the pre-crisis trend. Think about that. The British economy is only just back, almost back to where it was six or seven years ago. Australia didn't experience any of that. Now, this slow recovery in the developed world is a product of complex forces. No doubt that profound technological change, ongoing impacts of globalisation, the hangover of crisis settings caused by political gridlock have all played a part. But there's another factor that is increasingly important in this equation of explaining why growth in the developed world is so tepid and is so weak. And that is growing economic inequality. Now at the core of this conundrum of a lack of sustained demand to drive growth is a complex debate. There's no doubt we need structural reforms, including supply side reforms. They're required in developed and developing worlds, but they're not sufficient to make up for the lack of overall demand now and in the immediate future. And of course, this is what Larry Summers has described as a secular stagnation. The difficulty of sustaining demand which would permit normal levels of output. Now this debate about what do we do to lift global growth was at the core of the, the recent G20 uh, discussions in Brisbane, my home city, just two months ago incidentally held six years to the day of the Washington summit, which followed that emergency finance minister's meeting I was talking about before. That Brisbane summit agreed to a 2% growth target, and member countries agreed to submit, and indeed did put forward, something like 900 reforms that they would put in place in the next year or so to strengthen global growth. Fair enough, as far as it went. But what was quite regrettable about it, there was no discussion 
in the meeting or subsequently publicly about the extent to which those 900 reforms that were submitted promoted in inclusive prosperity or whether or not some of them in fact would result in greater concentrations of wealth and income. And indeed, a number of the Australian proposals in that list will do precisely that. They're not actually the sort of structural reforms that give structural reforms a good name. Stopping people getting unemployment benefits for a long period of time. Timely with unemployment benefits is not the sort of structural reform uh, that we ought to be doing or that will necessarily garner public support. Now, in recent years, there's been an avalanche of analysis from the IMF, the OECD, all arguing that relative equality is good for growth. This is a big turn up for a body like the IMF to actually not only argue that relative equality is good for growth, but argue in favour of redistribution. But they did. And in fact, Christine Lagarde went as far as saying that growing inequality is casting a dark shadow, a dark shadow over the global economy. Now, everybody's familiar with the data and it's so stark here in the United States about the extent to which the middle class in this country is hollowed out. And there's just been income stagnation over, uh, over 30 years. That in itself is what I call a handbrake on growth. The consumption that used to come from people earning good middle class incomes is not there. And that in itself becomes an inhibitor for investment as people ponder their decisions about where they're going to commit their capital in the years ahead. They'd like to think they might have a few more customers with a bit more disposable income. But all of this was missing in the G20 discussion. So what is really required now is a much more informed analytical debate about what we do do to strengthen global growth and fairly share its benefits. And of course, that's what the report that's being released tomorrow precisely does. It's been incredible to sit back and watch some of the com commentary we've seen from senior global policymakers, which has not necessarily been taken up in the political world. This is what Mark Carney had to say uh, early last year at a conference in Paris. He said this, unchecked market fundamentalism can devour the social capital essential for the long-term dynamism of capitalism itself. In other words, for markets to sustain their legitimacy, they need to be not only effective, but also fair. These sort of statements from Janet Yellen, Mark Carney, Christine Lagarde and so, and so on, I know do anger the plutocrats around the world who have their political representatives arguing for unregulated markets, the ripping out of social safety nets, and the lowering of taxes across the board as if those issues themselves are somehow an elixir for growth. There's no dr greater driver of inequality than high levels of unemployment, and of course high levels of youth unemployment exacerbate the intergenerational impact of unemployment. So we do require bold structural reforms and a boost to demand. But if we're going to get those structural reforms, they've got to be the right structural reforms that promote inclusive growth, that don't result in a further increase in the concentration of wealth and income. So to have a successful reform program, to come out of a body like the G20, or to come out in a national uh, economy such as the Australian economy, there's got to be a clear linkage with those reforms to the jobs they promote and the fairness that flows from them because they'll never be implemented if the population generally can't be convinced that the gains will be fairly distributed. And of course, therein lies the problem uh, with the Australian budget and why it is so gridlocked, because most of the changes are not fair income structural reforms, they're deform, they're deforms, which actually result in more unfairness, uh, not less. So many of the prescriptions that are put forward by the laissez-faire brigade aren't about wealth creation and maximising jobs. Actually, what they are about is wealth concentration, further wealth concentration. I absolutely understand there'll be those that say, if you oppose these reforms, you don't understand growth. As a finance minister for six years, I understand what drives growth, productivity. But what will drive productivity is the correct decision about the correct reforms. 
to lift productivity. Fostering gains, gains in broad-based productivity is the foundations of long-term of, of long prosperity, which we need to spread opportunity. So if we are to build more productive and inclusive economies, we have to acknowledge that inequality isn't a fringe issue. And combating its rise is absolutely fundamental to kick-starting growth across the developed world. And of course, more importantly, putting in place the effective structural reforms that will drive it. And here I think the Australian experience is particularly relevant. What we do need, and the foundations of fairness, fairness are there, in good public investment in affordable quality health and education, all underpinned by fairness in the workplace. A, a decent minimum wage, collective bargaining arrangements which reflect the productivity issues that I spoke about before, a strong public-private partnership in the pension system, similar to our superannuation system, a series of reforms that promote competition. All of those are a structural reform agenda that underpin the importance of uh, lifting productivity. But in the meantime, before that can be done, there does need to be a substantial boost to global demand, and there's one or two very easy ways to go about that and quickly. And the IMF has pointed to this, and that is, a substantial increase in public and private investment in infrastructure. Over and above that, you know, a rapid increase in lifting the quality of education. Those two things uh, can be implemented relatively quickly in many economies around the world. Central to this debate about the role of government is also a discussion really about your view of who generates wealth. In my world, in my social democrat world, Nurses, builders, teachers, construction site labourers, hairdressers, shop assistants, waitresses are all generators of wealth. Just are, just as small business people are, as bankers are, as multinational companies are. Everybody is a generator of wealth. Until we come to grips with this concept that everybody is in it together, and we're all generators of wealth, we will struggle to deal effectively uh, with the issues of inclusive prosperity. We will continue to see too many recipes of what I'd call trickle-down economics, which hasn't really worked, hasn't, the gains of that have not necessarily been as fairly shared, and what we've seen is industrial organisations representing working people smashed, their job security and conditions with it. And of course they were told that at the end of this process there would be the jobs and the incomes that flow from it. There aren't too many countries in the world where we can actually say that has happened. Because the truth is a rising tide doesn't necessarily lift all boats. Because all boats are slightly different. And we need a set of structural reforms that make sure that some people who are unlikely to be lifted can be lifted as well. And the policies that reflect it. So we're all in this uh, together. So on that Saturday night back in October 2008, the G20 commenced a remarkable thing, which was to avoid a Great Depression Mark II. I wish we now had the same commitment from world leaders that we found during the global financial crisis to ensure that we now find new policies to grow together, because if we don't, we'll grow apart. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very well done. I want to start with a question, and then I'll open it up to the uh, to the audience. And I guess the question is: um, Are you focusing on developed countries? Because I, you know, if we look at uh, developing countries, I think there there's a question there, right? How do how can governments play the role that you'd like them to play if they don't have the institutions and the trust established with uh, people in their private sectors to? accomplish these goals, and I, I wondered if you would talk about that, because if, if we look at the region that, that you live in and that we're on the beach uh, or we're on the, uh, the borders of, the Indo-Pacific, um, you know, the OECD looks at a, at a middle class that is now uh, somewhere near uh, 500 million, but will be 3.2 billion people uh, in 20, by 2025. Um, so I wondered if you might uh, 
share some, some thoughts about how, that. Sure, and he will. There's a, a, a variety of ways I could, I could comment that, but I'd also make the point to start with that this concentration is also happening in the developing world. Mm. So whilst millions of people in the developing world are, be lifting, are being lifted out of poverty, you are starting to see some really huge concentrations at the top in a number of those countries. So that in itself uh, is very much an issue across uh, the developing world. It's just that uh, you had to take a manageable bite of this uh, and the hollowing out in the, uh, in the developed world is also a drag on the emerging world. Um, now, I hope uh, as they go through the development process and move up the value-added chain and lift more people out of poverty and uh, are creating even bigger and more successful and prosperous middle classes, that they don't make some of the mistakes that have been made, particularly, say, in this country, uh, the policy decisions which have seen the, the middle class here hollowed out. So, I think there's a message there, and it is as relevant uh, for the developing world as it is for the developed world. And uh, I know many policymakers in the developing world are looking and thinking at these issues. Uh, as a finance minister in Australia, you know it, it's, it's amazing to actually mix with a number of these uh, emerging uh, countries um, who uh, are very focused on reform. I mean, they are really focused on uh, on creating uh, wealth. Uh, and, uh, and lifting their living standards across the board. And uh, they're probably more knowledgeable mm. about many of the structural reforms that I spoke about than you'll find uh, politicians or policy makers in the developed world. Yeah. I mean, I've found through uh, my experience in bodies like APEC, uh, particularly at the G20, um, uh, the Australian example, for example, uh, Australian example is highly relevant and highly studied uh, by, um, by many policymakers in the developing world. I won't name the person, but uh, three or four years ago, uh, I was in a meeting uh, in one of the larger Asian economies that's done very well, and I'd taken their representative to the Foreign Investment Review Board to have a talk about our approach, what we were doing. Uh, they brought in a number of their experts, and in the middle of the conversation, this minister said, now, your policy of horizontal fiscal equalisation. <laughs> and I, I said, what? <laughs> um, there's only five people in Australia that understand what horizontal fiscal equalisation is and for everybody here. That is the method we use to basically take monies out of the more prosperous states and give it to the less prosperous states with the objective of everyone around the country getting the same level of service in health or education or whatever. Known as horizontal fiscal equalisation. He was quite familiar with it, mm. um, as indeed they are with um, any number of the reforms that I ran through before. Our, our whole retirement income superannuation system, subject of extensive study. Uh, Hector here from the Treasury uh, spent some, has spent some time in the region. Um, you know, requests for this sort of information come through all the time, but you know, whether it's our transfer payment system, take China. I mean, moving from an investment-led export model to a consumption model, they're all looking at it. Methods of healthcare delivery, retirement age um, uh, delivery, chronic, I mean, you name it. Yeah. All of these things are very much on the agenda. And the sort of models that actually get a Guernsey in, in these discussions, you always find that there's a couple of Australian models that, that are there, mm. good ones and the bad ones. Mm. So um, it's very much on the agenda uh, there as well. Um, but you, you cited the example of infrastructure. Uh, it's a classic example of where governance really matters. So if you're going to marshal uh, public and private finance for infrastructure in the developing world, the real challenge there isn't the availability of money, it's whether the investors have the faith uh, that it's going to be invested within a set of guidelines and in an accountable way. That's why this whole discussion about you know, whether, whether there's going to be a new um, China investment bank who right. kicks into it, uh, its relationship to uh, the Asian Development Bank, how they all fit in with the World Bank uh, are really important. But even if all the money's available, unless you've got the governance in place, um, you know, the cost-benefit analysis, the rigorous scrutiny of how these things are done, then the easy way to kickstart growth across many of the Asian countries, and every, every one of them names their number one priority at the moment is infrastructure. Right. A country like Indonesia, for example, but more than, more than them. Uh, these issues are the ones that need to be nut nutted through. Quite different 
from that debate uh, in, in developer countries. I mean, it's amazing this country is not taking the opportunity of record low rates to have a massive infrastructure program to fix up uh, you know, what is a pretty old and flagging infrastructure here, which doesn't necessarily suffer from you know, the sort of governance type issues I was talking about before. Mm. Public or private or some combination of both uh, is doable right across the developed world, uh, but a bit harder in the developing world, which is why we need our multilateral institutions uh, really focused on it. So that's just one example of, of that difference. Let me open the floor to uh, questions, observations that you might have. Right here in front, the blue shirt. Connor Sislow with the Asahi Shimbun. You mentioned the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank very briefly, and I just wanted to ask you a bit more specifically about that. Um, there's been a fair amount of writing recently, I think, about whether or not Australia will join, and I wanted to know your personal thoughts on that, as well as if you had any commentary about the uh, current administration's I think Australia policies. should join, but it doesn't necessarily deal with the issues I just spoke about before. Um, for it to have standing, all those issues of governance you know, have to be settled, and as I understand it, I'm not, I'm not privy to these discussions, but the Australian government had some reluctance based on, on, on government, governance issues, but I can't speak for them, but they are relevant here. But let's say that they were all fine and essentially the same procedures or similar procedures to what a World Bank would do or what an Asian Development Bank would do are all there. Well, what could be wrong with it? I mean, but part of the problem here, and let's be frank, uh, is uh, is that uh, the IMF should have had its representational arrangements changed. Okay. There's no issue I spent more time on when I was doing multilateral stuff than changing the, the voice and representational arrangements. I chaired the committee that made the report and it's all done and dusted except it can't happen because the US won't agree and they haven't got it through the Congress. So a little wonder when the developed world can't actually fix up a problem as simple and as logical as making the IMF representative of the entire global economy and giving fairness to the developing world, that the developing world would say, well, we might go and do our own, thanks very much. So that's, um, that's pretty understandable. Would that extend to the, um, the structure of the World Bank and uh, well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that there's, uh, I, I, it could be, but I'm not sure that anyone's really worried about the structure of the, the World Bank. There's been change there too. But the one, and, I'd have to d double check where that's up to, but the IMF is a symbolic organisation, uh, and you know it's very symbolic, almost at every level. And the fact that it can't actually make itself representative of its members, because one country has got politics with, which has gridlocked its approval methods, is not a very good outcome. Um, now, you know, I think we need a lot more ca capital marshalled. Uh, for infrastructure across both the developed and the developing world. Uh, I'm, I was gobsmacked, for example, that the G20 uh, leaders meeting could not even see its way through to supporting the IMF recommendation uh, that said that at this stage it's actually cheaper and more efficient and economically better for governments to borrow and use debt financing to in this current environment to build infrastructure than it is uh, to, uh, um, you know, to do anything else. Uh, and that's just sheer ideology. It's the ideology that stopped the G20 talking about climate change, the same ideology that stopped the G20 talking about inclusive prosperity, stopped what should have been a better infrastructure outcome at the G20. Now, as far as it went, it was fine. So they, they agreed that they'd set up in Australia a body which would assist the rest of the world with governance arrangements that I was talking about before. Fine, good, hope it happens, uh, great for Sydney, uh, but, but if we, given this challenge we've got of weak growth, which some people accept as secular stagnation, other people contest it doesn't really matter, common sense tells you that at the moment, aging population in the developed world, uh, rapid technological change, ripping into occupations, higher up the income scale, there's one simple way to, to really give a boost to global demand, and that is to get a few decent infrastructure projects going across the developed and developing world. It shouldn't be beyond us to get at least a couple of the multilateral institutions to look after what can be done immediately in the, de in the developing world, and developed world countries get on with, that have got the capacity on their balance sheet 
uh, to do it with public finance or public finance and private finance. This country certainly has, our country has, Germany has, any number of countries do, some don't. But that was you know, a pretty incredible piece of work from the IMF given uh, its history, but largely ignored um, in the G20 uh, leaders and finance ministers' deliberations. Why? For the reason I just spoke about in my presentation. It's an ideological thing. Government shouldn't be doing these things. A vibrant economy uh, in a market system, a vibrant market economy, always needs an active, vibrant referee, which is the government. As you've done this work, have you found private sector leaders who embrace? Too uh, right. Well, we've got a couple on. Uh, there's about 15 people that have contributed uh, to this report. Uh, it's coming out tomorrow. And yes, the private sector leaders. And indeed, there's been a pretty healthy debate in this country. Right. Um, I tell the story, I, I was reading Politico, a bit of an advertisement for Politico about the, um, sure the, the, the billionaire from uh, California who, who coined the term that they'll be coming for us with pitchforks mm. soon. Um, and just as I was reading that, uh, that Politico article, I, I happened to be in New York and I walked the High Line. Uh, and I was, got towards the end of the High Line down towards the financial district. And I, I had my head in all of this because um, I was writing something about it. And I looked up, and there's this sort of six-storey building which has got this huge sign plastered across it. And it says very simply, the French aristocracy never saw it coming either. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I don't think that's where we are. But as Christine Lagarde has said, <coughs> sort of concentrations we're getting are not sustainable economically. Forget, if you, if you, if you want for a minute, uh, the whole idea of fairness. For me, a socially mobile and fair society is a more optimistic one anyway, which is a, dyna a dynamic in the, in, the, in the economy that you can't measure. You can't put it in a spreadsheet. You can't measure the quality of life that comes from all of those things. Uh, but <coughs> we know it's now bad just in pure economic terms. Mm. Floor's open. Doug? Right up here in the front. Thank you. Hi, my name is Doug Paul from the Carnegie Endowment. I wanted to ask you about your policy prescriptions as laid out in the speech or elsewhere and how they interface with globalization. I have in mind the recent very sharp protests in Hong Kong and Taiwan where a lot of younger people there feel they're not getting the housing, the benefits, the jobs, and the incomes that they, their parents experienced led them to believe would come their way. And some of this is ascribed to various causes. One to be that globalization has now brought so many competitors into the workforces of the world that labor markets need to be adjusted to, and education needs to be adjusted to put people in the, in the right places to be able to have those expectations met. Uh, you seem to know what I'm talking about. How about your response? Oh, well, it's a really good question. Uh, there's, there's no question that the pre part of the outcome of the middle class hollowing out has been globalisation. Um, that is, that um, you know, the movement of uh, industries to lower cost areas of production and so on. Uh, but that's not a reason to reject it. It's a reason to embrace um, a whole suite of policies that, that flow from that. Uh, the fact is that um, uh, there has been a whole lot of industry which is now moving, that moved out of uh, developed countries and moved to developing countries is now moving out of those countries and going to others. I mean, the Chinese are moving over to a consumption-based economy based on the fact that they're going up the value-added chain and doing things more successfully higher up. That's what we want for the whole world. <laughs> uh, so. If you're talking about economic growth, it cannot and must not ever be divorced from productivity. And we must be always striving to be more productive. Uh, as we strive to be more productive, we increase our overall living standards. And technology is part of that. But you know, the, the big debate that's coming, again, is one that we've had in the whole of my political life and it's manifested itself in various changes. But you know, there's very, material around, say, called you know, the book called The Second Machine Age, um, that there's a wave of technological change coming now which looks like it's going to smash or has the potential to really carve into 
a lot of people who previously thought they were impervious to it, people on relatively higher incomes with professional standards, uh, you know, who could end up being just like what happened to a number of unskilled process workers mm. years ago who used to work, work in a number of the factories that aren't there anymore. So all these things are happening and, and, and we've, got to, we've got to cut our cloth uh, as we try and think about the policy responses to these things. You know, you don't react to the advances in technology by smashing the, you know, <laughs> the machinery in the woolen mill or, you know, going down and doing something to Apple. <laughs> this is going to happen. The question is, how do we harness it? What are the policy frameworks we put around it? How do we make most people benefit uh, from it? Now, we've got a big debate coming up in the UN. The Millennium Development Goals are coming up again. There's going to be a... And there is, I know, because I've been talking to a number of people, a more informed discussion happening uh, through that process, particularly about uh, the developing world. Uh, all of these things uh, are complex, but I don't... Our capacity to actually deal with them, uh, I think, is increasingly being hindered by the unfairness of what people are seeing around them. Other questions? Sorry, I thought that was, uh, I thought that was a question. Yeah. In the front. Oh, I, you've got one back there in the next. Yeah, hi, uh, Joshua Meltzer from Brookings. Um, you mentioned briefly in your speech that um, Australia's been growing consecutively for a number of years, but it's facing a couple of headwinds. Could you just go into some more detail what you think the challenges are for Australia in the near and future and what policy prescriptions you would suggest to harness some of the advantages that Australia has going forward? I'm really optimistic about the future of Australia, uh, but we are facing a few headwinds. And I could run through a, a few of them. Um, essentially, we're, we're, we're now moving uh, in transition from being predominantly driven well, not predominantly, but substantially driven by mining sources of uh, growth uh, or, or the mining investment boom, looking for other sources of non-mining growth. But the mining boom isn't over because the export boom is just happening because a lot of that kit that's been built is now starting to export. In fact, I think the first LNG tank is going, or, or nearly going out of Gladstone, um, you know, as we speak. Yeah. So the mining uh, boom has had various phases. The investment boom is now largely over or tailing off, always going to, some people call it a cliff. That was the labour intensive part of mining. And, and we need to see more investment outside the mining sector. Uh, and that is starting to happen, but it's been slower. Uh, we had tremendous headwinds when I was there. We had a high dollar and high interest rates, which were both two big countervailing forces to what was a huge investment surge. The big advantage we've got at the moment is we've got uh, very low interest rates and we've got, finally, uh, a dollar which is more like real value and reflecting the change in terms of trade. Although some would argue it probably should be lower if it was a, lower than it currently is, but at least it's 20% you know, off what it was. So uh, we are still seeing a lot of uh, money being invested uh, in Australia. I think we've got a short-term problem with confidence, which is uh, self-induced by the government, uh, by their budget, and it's failure to pass. and, and uh, is failure to really look like it's in charge of whatever is going on. Uh, but that's only, you know, that will work its way through the system. Uh, but we are growing slower now than we have in a while. Uh, the consequence of that is uh, higher unemployment. Uh, but the, the medium to long term, uh, the future for Australia has always, always been in our people. Yes, uh, what we get out of mining is great. Uh, it's still not the dominant industry in the economy, either employment or necessarily investment. Uh, we're, you know, however you want to manage it, 12th largest, 13th largest, 14th largest economy. Big dynamic economy is future, uh, and, and its current base is in services, notwithstanding mining. I mean, the Australian economy is powered not just by mining, it's powered by, by being a modern services economy. And fantastic opportunities are there for us as these middle class uh, classes emerge further across the region. That's just not China, it's right across the region. Um, I think the great success of Australia in recent times, put all this aside, has been just how comfortably we now fit into our region. Uh, when we uh, put the Asian Century White Paper out there in 2012, yeah. a lot of people said, oh, well, we already know all this. Well, in a sense, we probably did. But it came together in a document. Uh, an extensive consultation went on around the region. It was taken very seriously. Uh, it went out again. And as I moved around the region, you know, I suddenly thought, you know, for the first time in my political life, 
uh, we are now really not just saying that we're keen on Asia, but there's almost a, a you know, that, that, that we, there's no them and us as much anymore. There's just, oh, we're down here and we're all here together. And it's, it's, it's much more like that now. And I think, if you, you want to use the economic jargon, jargon, our greatest comparative advantage is what they see us as being. Or what or we want them to see us as being, which is an economy which is not necessarily the cheapest, because it can never be, we're a, you know, a rich, developed economy, but it's a place you'd like to go, it's a place that you respect, it's a place where you know you can buy decent services, it's a place that'll play an honourable role in the region and the world, it'll do the right thing, it's a place that's multicultural, it's accepting of, of the region, where as for most of its life it was in denial about it. They can see that embodied in the nature of our population, they can see it in the interchange of people. Um, these, are, these are the things that don't matter, you know, we've had, we went through um, sadly, the passing of golf. Uh, and there was, you know, a strong discussion about, well, what were all, all the, the achievements of, of the Whitlam government? To my mind, the biggest economic achievement of golf Whitlam was beating Nixon to China. Because you can't measure how much that was worth for Australia in China. And when I went there on the 40th anniversary of that visit, there are still people you know, who say they were here. They understood. Well, I have to say, on behalf of uh, CSIS, it's a great honor to have you here. Uh, it's, uh, it's not often when you have a, a great relationship with a, with a country and a group of leaders like you and your colleagues um, where you, you can come to the United States and, and yeah. tell us that we're, uh, you know, that we've got some bruises and, and uh, the clothes are unwrapped a little bit. Uh, and it's really helpful, actually. It's one of the things that we've, we really um, would like to continue. Uh, if a friend can't tell you uh, about where your bumps are, uh, you, then you're in trouble. Um, so thank you very much for taking time and talking to us today. Thank you. And just before we close, um, he is actually a, a, an avid tweeter. So would you tell us your Twitter handle so folks can follow you? Swanee Queensland. Yeah. <laughs> follow him. It's, uh, it's, it's more of this. And, and if you have a question. Well, Swanee QLD. Swanee QLD. At Swanee QLD. But follow him. Uh, it's really interesting. And uh, if, if you have some questions, maybe he'll, you can uh, pose them there and he might answer them. I'd love but to. Thank you again. Thank okay. you again. Yep. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you.